For those joining us via the webinar this afternoon, please note that there is a People's Choice poll for each division which will appear at the end of each division. To commence our competition this afternoon, uh, please welcome our first speaker from the Upper Primary Division, which is Toby Young. Thank you. Crash! Bang! Boom! This may sound like a war, but it's just shopping for supplies in 2020, pushing people over, crashing trolleys, and that's on a good day. Hi, I'm Toby Yani, and today I'm going to be talking with you about what it's like for shopping and supplies in 2020. First, I'm going to share with you my experience of going shopping. When I went shopping on Mother's Day, it was very intense. Everyone was crowding in the one shop waiting for their turn. And then before all this corona nonsense, it was like nobody even existed. So let's go over the facts. Before Corona, everyone's ready a month early. And during Corona, no one's ready until the last second. Something's not adding up. Just relax, but not too much, and use your time at home to be productive. My next point will be on online shopping. About one month ago, me and my mum ordered something online. Guess when it got here? Well, it hasn't yet. Is it just me, or when you're ordering something online, you feel really responsible? It's just something about doing something yourself and no, without a parent. But then your heart drops when you see the delivery time. Three months, whoa. Then when it's meant to arrive, you drive up to the post office and ask the lady and she says this. Um, actually your package is in Afghanistan and it won't arrive for three more months, bye. And then you drive home in a disappointment in a disappointed mood, knowing that it won't be here for another three months. Then, the day it's actually here, you go to the post office, open the package, and it's some weird knockoff Gucci or something. Probably shouldn't have ordered it from knockoff.com. Now, let's get into some real shopping. From what I see on the news, the shopping centre is kind of like an arena from ancient Rome, cr pushing people over, fighting to the death to get to the toilet paper. Why is toilet paper the thing everyone's after? If you think about it, it's just some stuff that ends up in the toilet. Not like a bar of gold or something. There's actually plenty of supplies for everyone, including toilet paper. Finally, I'm going to say why you shouldn't panic buy. If we did end up running out of supplies, it would be because of panic buying. And as I said earlier, there's loads for everyone. Just shop when you need to shop and chill down. We're not going to die. Before I go, I'm going to leave you on this thought. Do you want to be the one who makes our community run out of toilet paper? Thank you, good luck on your toilet paper seeking adventures and bye. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. That was very reflective of the times we are currently facing, which I think we can all relate to. We'll just wait for our adjudicators to finish so before we welcome the next speaker. All right, good to go. Uh, next, please welcome Georgette Philpott. Picture this, every fairy tale princess that you know and love departing from their golden carriages to attend a royal ball where they will meet each other for the first time. All is cupcakes and rainbows until Prince Charming dramatically parades into the grand ballroom to the thunderous applause of his important royal subjects and has to choose someone to dance with. Who will it be? Courageous Cinderella, beautiful Belle, astonishing Ariel, stylish Snow White, fantastic Fiona, or not quite sleeping yet, beauty. Each of these characters has imagined themselves spending their happily after as Princess Charming and one day Queen Charming. All of them but one are going to get their bubbles burst. Good afternoon teachers, students and fellow speakers. Today I'm here to talk to you about the mistakes in our favourite fairy tales. Prince Charming this and Prince Charming that. Prince Charming married Cinderella, Prince Charming married Snow White, Prince Charming married Sleeping Beauty and Prince Charming also married the Little Mermaid. If Prince Charming is so charming, why can't he just find one princess and settle down? This is a fairy tale mistake. 
Have you ever seen a bear eating porridge? I didn't think so. A big mistake in Goldilocks and the Three Little Bears is that one, I don't think a bear would know how to make porridge, and two, where did the porridge come from in the first place? Did Mama Bear just walk into Woolies, pick up some oats and do her contactless payment with dead fish? Or is something much stranger going on? Imagine a little two kilo puppy pulling your hair. Trust me, it hurts. Now imagine an 80 kilo wicked witch climbing up your hair. I don't know what it actually feels like, but I can imagine it would hurt a lot. I am pretty amazed Rapunzel still had hair to cut off in the end. If Cinderella's glass slipper fits so wonderfully well in the end, why did it fall off in the first place? Imagine how expensive a glass slipper would be. If I had a glass slipper, I wouldn't wear it to a fancy party where it would fall off and someone would come and hunt me down and I'd be forced to marry them. What a ridiculous idea a glass slipper really is. Imagine if the heel broke and she had a terrible accident down those steps. Finally, Princess and the Pea. I get that if the pea was frozen, it would make a slightly uncomfortable lump in the mattress. But after a while, the pea would unfreeze and turn into a puddle of slimy goo. How can she feel a puddle of slimy goo under all those mattresses? Besides, surely there are more important qualities for the woman of your dreams, like cooking the perfect lasagna or being able to mow the lawn. Better still, being able to ski off Michael's mistake or being a rocket scientist. I don't know about you, but I still like fairy tales, mistakes and all, because if you took out the mistakes, there would be fairy dull stories. Thank you, Judette. That was a very enlightening speech that painted some very vivid pictures. Our final speaker in the upper primary division is Stella Smith. Sorry, our third speaker for this division is Helena Smith. The dream street I'm going to build when I'm older. I have a dream. It's going to be beautiful. People will come from all over the world to visit. I like to call it my street. I've been thinking about this dream street for a long time. It's going to be in England, either in Wimbledon in the south of London or maybe in Gretton in a small village in the Cotswolds. It'll include all kinds of shops. Have a funky hairdresser who will do amazing cuts and can dye your hair any colour. I think I'll go for blue ombre to start. There'll be a pet shop with the cutest dogs, cleverest cats and fluffiest bunnies and as well as many other creatures. I have a pet for everyone and anyone. There'll be shops selling beautiful and unusual things. There'll definitely be a toy shop with, the, with an amazing range of the best soft toys that even adults will love. They'll have beautiful dolls and a special Lego set of my street. There'll be a clothes shop with only the most comfortable, cool looking gear. No scratchy tights or stiff shirts here. It will also have a boutique hotel with a spa. I'm thinking modern, but every room will be different. There'll be a super cool bar and cozy lounge area with a buffet and big squishy sofas, bean bags and a fireplace. Last, but no means least, there'll be my bakery. My dream bakery is inspired by the chocolaterie in the movie Chocolat and my favorite French patisserie, Chevrolet. When you walk in, it will smell extraordinarily delicious. The air will be filled with the warm scent of chocolate ganache, cinnamon, spice, lemon and berries. It will have an old chalet look with lots of beautiful dark wood and a roaring fire in a cosy fireplace where you can sit in comfy armchairs and beanbags drinking bowls of spice hot chocolate with, with clouds of fluffy whipped cream on top. The carved wooden shelves and display cabinets be full of the most amazing confectionery, cakes and treats like Milfoy, chocolate pyramids and cream filled eclairs. There will be a chocolate fountain in the middle of the room. So it's going to be a pretty long street. I have to work really hard and employ lots of people. 
but I've already recruited five of my best friends to help me make it the most amazing street in the world. Your invitations will be in the mail in about 20 years time. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Helena, for that speech. It made me quite hungry <laughs> thinking about some of those foods. All right. Our final speaker in the upper primary division is Stella Smith. What has your family been up to during quarantine? Playing outside? Having family time? Playing board games? Well, that's the opposite of what my family have been doing. Eating, sleeping, eating, and binging Netflix. That's what my family have been doing. Welcome parents, teachers, and students to the Smith Family Show. Today, we'll be meeting the Smith Family. I hope your seatbelts are on, because it's going to be a bumpy ride. The oldest sibling of the family, and certainly the moodiest, is Ruby. Ruby never sleeps. She honestly should move to New York. At least she would fit in. Every night, she stays up all night doing all sorts of things, and then struggles to get out of bed in the morning. When she wakes up in the morning, she's moody, and you dare not to say a word to her. There's the occasional, Good morning, Ruby. How was your sleep? And the only reply is, nothing. Absolutely nothing. When this corona stuff started, she was sleeping in until 10 in the morning. I can't even sleep until 7. I wonder if she would be better with the corona. She would at least get some sleep, but might not wake up. Even though Ruby can get on my nerves, without her, life would be miserable. She's my best friend, and I, and I enjoy every quarantine moment I get to spend with her, whether it's listening and jamming out to music to crying to each other when we don't want to do something. The next family member we're going to meet is Dad, the chef of this crazy family. He cooks the family dinner every night and helps, and helps me, the little baker in the family. The problem here, though, is that this man is not a good housewife. He never cleans up nor helps around the house but he's pretty good at eating. Ever since quarantine, I think something happened because yesterday I actually saw him cleaning the house. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Dad eats that much food, I don't know how his tiny little body holds it all. If he eats one more thing, I think he might explode. But despite that, he's fit and skinny and never works out. I mean, I wish. When I eat, I turn into a giant blueberry. But I love at nighttime when he comes and gives me a cuddle and kisses. The furriest member is a four-legged man named Sage, the cat. Now, I wish I was him. The only thing I ever see him do is sleep. I can only dream. I think he gets a bit sick of everyone being home from COVID-19, waking him up in his beauty sleep and trying to play with him. That's why I think he wakes everyone up with his meowing and scratching of doors. I mean, it's sort of fair. His Royal Highness gets his poop cleaned up after him. That's just pushing it, pushing it. The good thing about my furry companion is the warm cuddles at night. Even though these can sometimes turn into a scratching war, I still love them so much. My favourite and sometimes least favourite member is Mum. I don't know what this quarantine is doing to this poor lady. Is it normal to be cleaning the house 24-7? Because I don't think so. I mean, I love her because she does the washing and keeps the house clean. But sometimes she does that a bit too much. The bad thing about Mum is that she gets you doing all the jobs like a little minion or something. And when you don't do the job she told you to, you're in for a treat. And it's not a tasty one, that's for sure. She will either give you a lecture on how you didn't do the jobs or make you do more jobs, when the only reason you didn't do them was because you had online school. Like, would she prefer me to skip school to do the jobs around the house? Think about that one, Mum. But in the end, Mum is always the one who makes me feel safe and happy, and I don't know what I would do without her. This about sums up the Smith family have in quarantine. I hope you enjoyed me babbling on about the good and bad things about my crazy family in quarantine. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. I think we can all say that family time was one of the positives from the quarantine. Please welcome our first speaker from the junior division, Samantha Steins Garrity. Sam, you're good to go on your call. Thank you.
It was pitch black, all the way in the thick, twisting woods of Pino. I took a deep, shaky breath and went on the heavy encouragement from my friends to hit the 35 foot kicker. As I was approaching what felt like a death wish, I was preparing myself for all the glory and bragging rights for years to come after hitting this tsunami jump. Before I could put my foot down, I was up high in the air. The glory was in my sights. I reached for it and bang, I had hit the deck. Blood and organs oozed from my left side. Enormous pain surged through my body. Pools of blood surrounded and flowed down to my defeated bike. When my friends reached my location, a scene from Braveheart came to life. It was gruesome. I limped home, my helmet cracked solid in half. This was how I explained it to my dad. I was hoping he would react with the same sympathy and drama you all have, but he resorted to downgrading my story to, it's only a flesh wound. Have a can of concrete and harden up. You'll get over it. I know this seems harsh, but he is an Australian dad and his point was, things could have been a lot worse. So go ahead and tell me you're having a bad day. Tell me about the traffic on the M1. Tell me about the teacher you really hate and have to have for the rest of the year for an hour every week. Tell me when you wake up and roll out of bed, it feels as if you're burning to a pile of ash in a raging house fire when only four months ago, people lost their lives and belongings in the Australian bushfire season. Tell me your alarm clock stole the keys to an extra hour of sleep when half the people in Africa don't even have a bed. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Tell me how amazing it is our problems are so small they can slip out on the tips of our tongues when nearly 1,500 people die each day. 185,000 people each year amputate a limb. You see, the human race is somewhat ungrateful for all they have. They complain about minor details. When if you were to flip your opinion around, you would see that each day, 360,000 babies are born. When you get punched in the stomach by a fistful of luck, remember that over 7 million people each year die of dehydration. So it does not matter if the glass is half full or half empty. There's water in the cup, drink it and stop complaining. Arnold Schwarzenegger tells us muscle is made up by repeatedly lifting things designed to weigh us down. When your shoulders feel heavy, people call lifting weights exercise. So suck it up, lift up your chin, stand up straight and call it exercise. Remember, you are still here, still alive, still breathing, eating, seeing, hearing, living. Oh, the human heart beats approximately 4,000 times per hour. A lot more when you're doing a Maria Kissage speech. But remember that every pulse is a new engraving on your heart in the middle of your chest with the words, you are still alive. Things could be a lot worse. It's all well and good to criticize the human race and to tell them just to suck it up. But remember, we are only human. We can only endure so much and it's natural and healthy to let it out and cry every once in a while. But my point I'm trying to make is, after you've processed these spinning emotions, remember, every day is a new day. Even if your day was the worst thing you've ever experienced, know somebody out there has had a much worse one. Sometimes it's good to try and focus on the things we have instead of the things we don't have. And no, in the bittersweet end, things could be a lot worse. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, please welcome our next speaker from Year 7, Nell Ong. Imagine this. You walk into a whole new school. You barely even know the country around you. You haven't been here long enough. That was me in 2016. One minute I was in a house I called home. Next minute, all of my belongings were packed up. I was moving far away. I had no say whatsoever in the move. I did not want to leave. I just figured everything out, who my best friend was, plus I had the perfect little friend group. And I knew everybody, young to old. But just like that, I was moving away from my friends, away from my family, away from my, away from my life, and away from everything I ever knew. It was like dying and being brought back into the world, which gave me two lives, that one and this one. 
Moving is one of the hardest things I've ever had to face so far in life. I had to leave so much behind, yet that didn't seem like the worst of my problems. I wasn't the only person moving. My best friend was too, but she wasn't coming anywhere near here. She was going all the way up to Queensland. So there I was, leaving the house I grew up in, leaving all of my friends and my school. But I was leaving my family as well. My grandparents lived around, so I was leaving them too. But we also knew a lot of people who over the years had become my family. And now I was leaving that all behind. Not sure if I'd get anything like that down here. I've always been a good people person, so I thought sure that I could make a really good impression on everyone. But I'd definitely over in my skills. The thing is, people aren't always the nicest. We don't make friends with people because they like the exact opposite type music we do. We make friends because we have stuff in common. In my first school down here, you were told you had to be friends with everyone. I tried my best, and can I just say, that was the worst school I have ever been to. It was the only school where I experienced bullying, bullying, but it was all because of the fact that I had to make friends with everybody. I was only year three, and I had to make friends with the year sixes. However, it's true that every cloud has a silver lining, because without going to the school I absolutely hate, I would have never met my best friend. From that point on, I moved on to a new school, where I spent three years of my life, and those years were the ones where I found a true group of friends. Moving was so hard for me, but having looked back at it now, I realised that it was just life throwing me another curveball, throwing me another challenge. Therefore, when I have a look back, I realise I was lucky, so lucky, because so many people stay in the same spot their whole lives. Some people don't even get to leave the country. I had those opportunities from a very young age. So no matter how hard it was, I'll always know that when people ask, why'd you move? Oh no, that was just life throwing me another curveball, proving that I was strong enough to overcome it. In hindsight, living was a huge deal for me. It gave me a lot of tears in my face and sometimes I just wanted to scream and run. But in the end, it's the best thing. And sometimes it's the worst thing that make us who we are. Thank you. Thank you, Nell, for your speech and for having the courage to give us some insight into your life. Welcome our next speaker from Year 8, Emily Wilson. Good afternoon to the lovely judges, everyone at home and here today. Now, I do have something to say just so you're all aware. I'm short. No, no, I'm really short. Yeah, like can't reach grandma's cookie jar short. Now, look, I know that being small isn't that big of a deal. But what I thought I'd do is take you through the life of a short person so you can all fully understand what the weather really is like down here. And just a little disclaimer, it's exactly the same. Now, I wanted to start with something obvious, teasing. Now, don't get me wrong, I laugh at the jokes too. But after a while, it gets boring. Every time someone says the word short, small, little, all the heads turn to me. Like, we get it, I'm small. But does it need to get this awkward? Am I just supposed to stand here while being stared down at by 30 pairs of eyes? No thanks. But I've always told myself to laugh and go along with the jokes. But after a while, I end up hearing the same simple teasing. I'm waiting for people to step it up and hit me with something I'm going to remember. But look, if you're short, some pretty funny jokes are going to be made. And yeah, you'll get tired of it, but you've got to embrace it. Next, we have one of my personal favourites, parties. When I was younger, you had to have limbo at your party. And as you can guess, I was pretty great at it. You know you're short if you can win a game of limbo by walking under that bar with your head held high. And on the rare occasion you needed to duck your head, your friends were nearly in the splits. So, top tip for everyone, don't challenge me to a game of limbo, because you won't win. All my friends used to get so mad at me for winning all the time. But what am I supposed to do? It's not my fault I can't reach the monkey bars. It's not my fault your dog's taller than me. Enough said? Yeah, enough said. Now, last off, we've got storage. Don't quote me on this, but I've found that my body isn't big enough to hold my personality. So basically, I look crazy all the time. And the same goes when I'm angry or tired. 
Similarly to this, I used to get pain in my chest while sleeping. I thought it was because the organs in my body were too close together and they would touch. I know now this is completely wrong, but you do feel oddly compacted, you know? All a bit too close. It's like someone accidentally squished me as a child and I was dented for life. Well, either that or it's just genetics. Thanks, Mum. Um, but look, for me, being short really does come with a shortage of personality storage. And so the normal amount of energy, anger, whatever it is, will tend to come off a bit strongly and spill over the top. So overall, I think we've learned some very valuable lessons today. Number one, if you're going to make a joke about my height, by all means, go ahead. But be creative, change it up a little. Number two, do not invite me to your birthday party if you want to play limbo and plan on winning, because you won't. And number three, if a short person comes off crazy, it's not their fault. Their bodies just can't hold on their personality. Thank you and have a wonderful day. <laughs>
And my dog will go full craze mode, like, oh, my Lord and Savior, the only reason I continue to live, you have graced me with your presence once again. And then he rotate between my mom and my dad, like, I love you, 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 I love you. And then I'd be on the couch, like, do you think you could love me? Hmm, nah. In conclusion, my dog doesn't love me. Sure, I love him. I worship him. I adore him. I worship, I imagine him flying with Jesus himself. And yet still, he does not love me. If some of my family was crying, he'd be kissing them, comforting them. If I was crying, he'd be there like, ugh, someone's a bit weak. Let's talk about her behind her back, shall we? Thank you all for listening to my unnecessary rant. You will all be, if not already, incredible therapists. And I will be a great client. I will see you all in therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Zali, for that zealous speech. Our final speaker in the junior division is Indiana Burke. Imagine that you're sitting there all alone in your bedroom, no one to play with. Good afternoon, adjudicators, chair people, and Zoomers. I'm Indy, and I'm an only child. Now I'm going to take you on my perspective as an only child. Now, we need to take it back when I was born. It was the 14th of November, 2007. And that's where I knew I was gonna be an only child for the rest of my life. It has been roughly 13 years without a sibling. It's been great. I had a horse who would bite me and I could go to my room and just relax with anybody poking me every second over and over again. Where I lived in Jindabyne, I was on a property. I had horses to ride, but I couldn't ride them because I was too little. And well, my horse would bite me. Mum couldn't come out and watch me because she was working all day. And Dad was in Mombala like every week. People always thought I was spoiled because I'm an only child, but I wasn't. I was one of those kids who played in mud and put water in my gum boots. I had no expensive brands whatsoever. I have always wanted a sibling to boss around and blame on, but I had none of that joy. Mum had three other siblings and Dad had two. Am I missing something here? Come on, why can't I have a sibling? But when there are positive sides, there might be some downhill moments to explain. I really would like someone to horse ride with who isn't my mum and go snowboarding with who isn't my parents and play and boss around when they break a drinking glass. Sometimes when you're an only child, you get bored and you wish you had someone to play with when your friends can't come over. What I love about being an only child is that I don't need to share mum and dad. And I get to do things without anybody nagging me every second, saying, can I borrow this? Oh, can I wear this to my friend's birthday party? It's great being an only child when your friends come over. Well, cause your sibling doesn't steal the spotlight when you guys are having fun. And plus, you can have a couple of friends over when you say to your parents, can I please have a friend over? But if I had a sibling, I'm pretty sure they'll beat me to it. In conclusion, a quote from Maynard James Keenan, because I am an only child, I do have my own little world. Now, would you like to have a sibling or be an only child? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Indiana, for that insight into your only child life. Uh, next are our immediate speakers. Our first speaker this afternoon in the intermediate division from Year 10 is Lucy Cross.
Where do you get your news from? Is it reliable? Are you sure? We are so influenced by what we read. If we read something, we are most likely to believe it. Nine out of ten people are likely to share that information, while six of those people would have shared it without even reading it. So many people make a judgement based off the headings, but what is the heading actually telling us? Can we believe it? It is so hard to distinguish between well-researched stories and power-stealing stories, as they are so influenced by political matters. This is seen all throughout history and in modern times, and will be explored with the Nazi reign, communist China and current elections. The journalism world can be well-rounded as a keystone to democracy and ethical values, though according to a report done by the Ethical, mm, the ethical Journalism Network, this is fast disappearing. The journalism world is still heavily influenced under politicians and corporate businesses have a codependent relationship with them that is not necessarily in the public's interest, especially when political agendas get in the way. It is so difficult to separate journalism from propaganda and imperial reports. As stated in the EGM, it is hard to com the journalism world is compromised by politicians and owners of countries where the media is on the front line of political battles. Many countries look to journalism as a tool to spread their power. Just look at the rise of the Nazi party. They are used manipulating propaganda to spread their power. Only the National Socialist German Workers' Party was allowed to broadcast about news, news and news articles, and they were the only ones that could produce the radio and movies, meaning that they were isolated from the world and could only have their influences based on what the party approved. Their news spoke of a new and better society under the dictatorial and total terrorism government. In this case, media wasn't propaganda. Propaganda was the media. This is also seen in China throughout the three years of starvation or the natural disaster and its aftermath. Wai Chim published a book called Freedom Swimmers, which outlines how the harsh times and how the media was on the front line in this case and how that affected people's lives. The city boys went around the towns telling them about the interests and beliefs of, the commun of Mao's Communist Party views. They couldn't understand why they didn't believe them or why they could see their struggling or use labour. The use of the media was so manipulated and aimed towards empowering the party instead of um, and saying then that the communist way was the right way. In current times, the University of Oregon, under the branch of journalism and propaganda, um, released an article outlining the six ways the media influences elections. It is so influential and can swing the voters. It says that through even choosing a side can swing the election through recognition. They also use social media to target certain groups and bombard them with one-sided information. The, another thing is a, a strategy we're all familiar with. A picture is worth a thousand words. The media outlets create and manipulate photos to tell a new story from a different point of view. This is done and is done to make us very vulnerable, as it's where all of our news come from. Many loopholes exist, um, it still exist today and influence heavily on our news. Statistics show that, that the companies look, look at the data and then decide on their view as to who their government, who their audience is and what they will talk to the audience about. PWE research that showed that 96% of Fox News viewers support Trump. Therefore, their content is pro-Trump. The NBC News found a similar thing, stating that their news was pro-Trump and pro-Republic bias. News outlets are supposed to be unbiased, so that we can make a judgment for ourselves. However, this is not always the case. It was found that News Corp was Mr Murdoch was accountable for 59% of the Australian media circulation, meaning that he accounted for so much of the Australian opinion and influenced us. Kevin and Rudd appreciated this and how he controlled the media cycle and took this to his advantage, which some say led to his win in 2007. Currently, News Corp is influencing us against climate change and for John Trump through, and persuading us through untrustworthy information. We are faced with the task to revive commitment, transparency, good governance and ethical journalism as stated by the EGM. We need to refocus on what is important and so they can honestly tell us what is important rather than manipulating us through biased information. We have to refocus on what is important, being ethical and unbiased, in order for us to decide what we believe and why. 
But in order to do so, the information has to be truthful, with a range of views, so it can keep, give us a balanced perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy, for that speech. It's such an important part of the media, and I think it's a really important thing to talk about. Our second intermediate speaker is from Year 9, Eli Fries. Welcome aboard passengers, this is your captain speaking. Kerosene should not be used in planes for many reasons. This substance was discovered millions of years ago and extracted from crude oils. Originally used in oil lamps, it eventually made its way into the air in the form of jet engines. This liquid is one of the most effective fuels for air travel, but it comes with some serious downsides. Kerosene produces dangerous fumes and smoke, which, if they got into the cabin, would be dangerous to passengers, and out of the cabin would seed clouds and emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This liquid also takes so many of the Earth's precious resources to mine and use. We need an alternative fuel source for planes that's not so harmful to the environment. Arguably the worst environmental concern for kerosene is its enormous amounts of, ca of carbon emissions. In 2019, the global airline industry recorded 39 million flights within a year. That's a whole lot of kerosene being burned off into our atmosphere, all of it emitting fumes and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And at that height, the effects are worsened even further, as the fumes have far, lef have far less of an atmosphere to get through than, say, petrol fumes from a car. Carbon dioxide is a mix between carbon and oxygen, this is created when the kerosene burns and the contained carbon mixes with the oxygen in the air, forming a chemical bond and being released into the air. Planes are an enormous source of the world's carbon dioxide and they need to be stopped. Another huge reason for kerosene to not be used is the fact that it takes loads of the Earth's resources to mine the materials necessary to create kerosene. This liquid is usually made by distilling crude oils and purifying them. To do this, you must first mine the oils, which requires either on-land drills or oil rigs in the sea. There are huge downsides to both of these methods. Land drilling would obviously massively affect organisms in the area. Drilling underground would affect insects and, bu and building enormous structures pumping out smoke would not only affect land-dwelling creatures, but also flying ones. Moving away from the land into offshore drilling, this method requires again massive structures, but this time in the sea. Apart from the fact that the, under, that the underwater drills kick up tons of sand and dirt, affecting the quality of the water around, oil also leaks into the surrounding water, killing fish and poisoning the area for any new creatures to arrive. In all, these mining operations are horrible for the environment and should be stopped if at all possible. On the same note of environmental concerns, kerosene has the ability to seed clouds while a plane's flying. Cloud seeding is usually seen when governments or local councils send silver iodide into the atmosphere to condense water, essentially creating a seed. Our own council uses this method to seed the snow clouds in the mountains. Usually, you could argue that cloud seeding is good, as it helps with droughts and brings tourists to areas. However, when on such a large, unintentional scale, it can hardly be good. When you see a plane flying overhead, that white trail you see behind it is actually a trail of clouds that the fuel in the plane is seeded. These trails of clouds pull moisture out of the air, and it's simply not natural. To summarize, it's clear to see that kerosene takes a huge toll on the environment with emissions, mining, and cloud seeding, and that we need an alternative fuel source. And without wanting to add to people's anxiety about flying, let's not forget that when you next fly overseas on an A380, you'll be seeded over 258.8 tons of highly flammable liquid, 
So sit back and enjoy the ride. Thank you so much, Eli. Climate change is a very big issue right now. I think it was a very good speech session for that. Uh, our next, please welcome Year 10 from Year 10, Isabel Weston. Good afternoon, adjudicators and audience members. I will be talking about why animal testing should be banned. Extreme amounts of animal cruelty are displayed in these animal tests. The worst part is that animal cruelty isn't actually the worst aspect of these tests. These tests can not only be wasteful, but also ineffective and extremely dangerous to both humans and animals. Firstly, animal testing can be extremely wasteful. Animal testing is wasteful in many aspects, some being time, money and resources. The US fund $50 billion into animal testing per year. Considering the success rate of animal testing in the US hasn't changed from 6% in 50 years, it shows that they're wasting a lot of valuable money and time. Most of the 6% of animal tests that actually do get chosen to be sold as medicinal drugs only help around 1 in 4 to 1 in 25 people. An example of wasted time is when they tested over 1,000 stroke treatments on animals and approximately 10% of those drugs made it to human trials. Of this 10%, none were actually effective in helping humans with a stroke. These statistics show the large amount of money, time and resources have been wasted in these animal tests. Secondly, animal testing is very ineffective. Animal testing can actually prolong the suffering of humans as animals have very different ca characteristics and diseases to humans. Examples of this are cancers, heart diseases, HIV, etc. It is no secret that animals do not have the same genetics as humans. A test that was conducted on mice DNA shows that only around 50% of mice DNA can be linked to humans. Since animals don't have the same DNA as humans, it means that they also don't have the same diseases or disease characteristics as humans, which means that diseases have to be artificially introduced or modified into the animal. Since the disease is artificially introduced, it can, it can in turn belittle the complexity of what the disease would be in humans, which means that in most cases, it also changes large aspects of the disease. Since the disease characteristics change in the animal, it, changes, it makes the drugs produced for humans very ineffective. The success rate of animal tested drugs is 10%. That means a whole 90% of drugs failed. The lowest success rate for animal tested drugs is cancer drugs, with a success rate of 5%. These statistics show that it is net very unnecessary and ineffective to have animal tests and experiments. Finally, animal testing can not only be dangerous to animals, but also to humans. An example of this is a drug called Viox. Viox was originally made to treat arthritis and seemed safe when tested on monkeys and other species of animals. When chosen to be sold as a drug, it ended up causing around 320,000 heart attacks and strokes. It also caused around 140,000 deaths globally. Another example was in 2006 at Northwick Hospital in the UK. Human volunteers were testing a new monoclonal antibody treatment. Many of the volunteers had severe allergic reactions and almost died. But when it was originally tested on monkeys, the outcome was completely different. <laughs> the last example I will talk about was in 2016. There was a new anxiety drug trialled in France. The, this drug was trialled on four different animal species with no bad outcomes. This was completely flipped upside down when taken to human trials. The results were terrible. One volunteer died and four other volunteers were left with severe brain damage. The outcomes for humans from these tests are not beneficial at all and should most definitely be banned. I believe that animal testing should be banned because animals are forced to live in inhumane ways. The animal cruelty that is displayed in these experiments is absolutely unacceptable, especially considering the low success rates of these drugs. 
So I hope that I gave you enough evidence to believe that animal experiments should without a doubt be banned. Thank you so much, Isabella. I totally agree with you. Uh, please welcome our next speaker from Year 9, Charlie Dickey. Getting outside of your comfort zone. Getting outside of your comfort zone is a phrase that we've all heard before. But why is it a good thing? Leaving your comfort zone is a good thing because firstly, it helps you grow as a person uh, and who you are. Secondly, it opens up more opportunities for you in life and it also will make you happier as a person. Good afternoon, parents, friends and teachers. Throughout life, everyone is going to be challenged at some point. Whether it's applying for your very first job or moving out of your parents' house. At the time, we may think these challenges like these are big, scary and intimidating. But the truth is, they're crucial in the making of who you are. Firstly, leaving your comfort zone will help you grow as a person. It does this because you're exposing yourself to new things and experiences, such as when I stepped out of my comfort zone and joined the school musical. When I made this decision, I was looking for a small role that wasn't too significant in the play but ended up being given one of the largest roles which uh, made me have to step out of my comfort zone more than I ever thought I would have to. At the time, I thought this was a bad thing and didn't want to do it. But now I realise it was, it was a good experience to go through and expanded my comfort zone accidentally, leaving me with more confidence for other challenges. Secondly, when you leave your comfort zone, more opportunities are opened up to you. This happens because when you step out of your of your comfort zone or what is considered normal or the usual, new things will start to appear. It's a series of trial and error. So when you try something new, you may hate it and never want to do that thing ever again. But if you find that, um, a new experience really fun and enjoyable and you're really good at it, um, you would have never known that was the case if you hadn't stepped out of your comfort zone. Say, so, you normally just sit and listen in, in the assembly but one time, a teacher asked you to step up on stage um, and speak on stage. When you do, you find that you're quite a good public speaker and really enjoy it. Uh, again, you would have never known they found this out if you hadn't stepped out of your comfort zone. Thirdly, getting used to leaving your comfort zone will make you a happier person in general. When you try a new experience, it, um, it, will, adapt, it will adapt into your comfort zone uh, to leave you with a larger horizons. Uh, and you can accommodate more because you have been through more experiences. An example of this is when we were little, we all remember being scared and shy to go up to the counter and order something. Um, so we would ask our parents to say what we wanted. When we grew up a little more, you would uh, start going up to the counter by yourself and we became more and more confident um, the more we did it. This shows us that when we stepped out of your comfort zone, um, as kids, we grew and became happier to do things on our own. So, uh, in conclusion, it's a great thing to step out of your comfort zone because it helps us grow as an individual and become better people. It also helps us become more confident, confident and happier as an individual. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. As someone in being in a few musicals, it can be a bit nerve-wracking. <laughs> Our final speaker in the intermediate division is from Year Ten, Alexi Cross. Isn't it funny how we go through life facing different challenges and constant changes? How we feel guilty about doing things for ourselves but ignoring the social norms of life? What is it that makes us feel this way? What is this pressure, this constant battle, these overwhelming feelings? Is it something that we have done to ourselves? 
or as something we simply had to live through. An expectation of what you do and how you're supposed to act. An expectation of what we wear, what career you focus on, sports, classes, everything. An expectation of life. Bungalow 2 is a book written by bestseller author Danielle Still. Danielle Still writes the stories of people, often focusing on the different challenges and difficulties that they face in their different walks of life. This particular book follows the story of Tanya and incorporates each of those themes, which are guilt, desire and self-determination. Primarily a mother to her three children, Tanya is a soap opera scriptwriter who gets her, offered her dream job of adapting a book into a film. However, when she is faced with a decision, she is overcome with guilt and conflict. This scenario begged the question, why, when faced with a decision, do we always feel guilty and overthink it? We try desperately hard to try and please everybody in that situation. There is a book in Bungalow, there's a line in Bungalow 2 that reads, she didn't want him to feel bad that she was going to say no. It was a sacrifice that she was more than willing to take. In this quote, Tanya is referring to rejecting the job offer in order to stay home and support her twin daughters as they go through senior year. It demonstrates how we can have uncertainty even when we are certain. Tanya has sacrificed herself while considering others. She has the expectation to be there for her daughters and must uphold it. Perhaps we put these expectations on ourselves or perhaps others do. Is it this obsession with keeping up a reputation that puts these expectations on us? There is a line in Bungalow 2 that reads, he always found it amazing that she led such an amazing life while still turning in some excellent work. We see how easy it is to stereotype a person's life. We only get to see the outside of what the person wants to show. In this case, Tanya's agent is describing her. He sees her as a talented writer, but one who lives a simple life. See, we only see the part that they show us. We don't get to see what's behind closed doors. In this case, he has defined her and therefore set up a reputation and an expectation in which she must uphold. Tanya is eventually convinced to go to Hollywood. However, as she leaves, her mind is still filled with uncertainty. Over time, um, she begins to settle in as she meets producers, directors and actors. But once again, her mind is filled with a thought, a negative thought. Instantly, Tanya felt ridiculously out of place. Why is it that we feel obliged to fit in with the norms set by society? To feel as if you're letting someone down if you don't wear the right clothes, look the right way or say the right things. Being expected to always look presentable and have to please all people as you go through life. Desire and self-determination are dominant themes in this book and are quite dominant in our lives. We have the desire to be the best, best at our sport disciplines, academics, games, the list goes on. Breaking us apart, right, we are constantly competing against ourselves and consequently ruining ourselves, breaking us apart each desire at a time. The desire becomes a flaw in our personality, but the focus of our mind. Douglas, a character in Bungalow 2, is a powerful movie producer. He is obsessed with victory. His greatest desire is success. While he has already earned the title of great movie producer, he needs more. As the book draws to an end, we see the movie that both Tanya and Douglas have been working tirelessly on, nominated for an Oscar. While the movie does not win the Oscar, Tanya is accepting. However, Douglas is not. There is a line in Bungalow 2 that reads, Douglas had to win. He had to have the power and control at all times. It is at this point in the book that Tanya realises that if she wanted to work with Douglas, she would have to be controlled at all times. She realises that the false expectation of being completely and utterly happy in a movie star's life is one of false pretense. In the end, Tanya turns to be happy with how she lives. She lives with no expectations. There is a line in the book that reads, some might call her life with Peter overly sterile and controlled, but she liked it that way. Others may have looked down on the way that she lived or may have wanted a different life. However, she was happy. Happiness is the only expectation we should expect from life.
so much, Alexi. Some really interesting topics from this division. Uh, now for our senior division. The first speaker from Year 11 is Benjamin Lee. As we look up to the start gate now, we see Aussie Scott Neller in the green. Zip up jacket, preparation. I remember the first superhero movie I ever watched. Superman with his blue suit and how he could fly just amazed me. I remember how strong Superman was, how he could overcome every challenge and how he was able to achieve the impossible. As we grow up, the spandex costumes slowly disappear. The toys are packed away one by one. However, the child still remains in us, looking up to who we idolise and who we wish to be. Now take a second, close your eyes. Take yourself back to that Saturday afternoon watching cartoons as your favourite person came up on the television. Do you remember that feeling? The person that made you want to strive for greatness, whether it's a person, celebrity, or maybe even a superhero. My person was Scott Neller, Australian ski cross racer. As a young boy growing up in the regional town of Jindabyne, my idol, Scott Neller, stood out to me. He took the ski world by storm, no pun intended. He was a wonder to watch able to make the ski perform in only ways I can imagine. Like a bullet out of a gun, plastic and metal working together to create this bizarre, aggressive dance down the hill. The moment I saw him on TV, he taught me about determination and personal bets. He taught me how to prepare. Kicking snow off boots. Support. Life is like a ski hill. There will be ups and downs. And that is true. But gee whiz, those ups will be long and steep. And those downs will be quick and fast. Growing up on the snow with skis strapped to my feet at only 18 months just feels normal to me. But I know that to many other people that is not true. The fact that I grew up snow, on snow certainly put the mind in my head, the figure in my mind that skiing was going to be a big part of my life. With my dad on ski patrol and my mum taking me up the hill whenever she could, I knew that all I wanted to do was ski. But boy oh boy, the uphill journey I went through to get to where I am now was tough. Support is the thing that helped me when the days I felt like giving up. Without family, friends and coaches pushing me, I wouldn't be where I am today. I still remember a night before training when my boots were just drenched. Mum wanted me to have dry boots, nice and toasty, for morning training. So she came up with the great idea of just using a hairdryer, which sounded like a perfect plan. A thing we forgot is the thin plastic layer located on the liner. Within maybe two seconds of mum trying to dry the boots, the, the liner started melting. Ah, what had happened to our foolproof plan? Although the top of the liner was melted for only a day, I felt as the liner was poking me in the back of my calf, and I just knew mum was there to support me. Pressed down into the binding. Clipped. Overcoming challenge. As all athletes know, overcoming challenges is a big part of a good athlete, especially in injury-prone sport such as skiing. Luckily, in my skiing career so far, I have not had that many injuries. However, the ones that I am faced with um, are like hip muscles, torn, dislocated knee and the occasional frostbite. I know that having to overcome injury is a big part of being an athlete. In order for me to really be prepared 
for these challenges, I just do fitness. Whether that's running or going to the gym, it all adds up in the end. Fitness not only helps me overcome the up and coming challenges of injury and mental challenges, but it also helps, helps me take a moment and realize why I'm, why I'm doing this. A jog will allow me to slow down and see the beautiful surrounding nature that I rush past and helps me concentrate and on my every breath I take, understanding why I strive for greatness. Goggles on, keep focused. Having the right mindset is not only about the race, but about life in general, and sets a path that I have learned um, gives me many options in life for the future. The skiing is the reason why I live, but in order to keep up and focus on my dreams, I also need to focus on what life will be like after skiing, or what happens if skiing doesn't go to plan. For me, school is important. Keeping concentrated on academic achievement is one of my main priorities. Snowy Mountains Grammar School has given me that opportunity to chase my dreams and keep focus on what is important. The amazing direction that people around the school have given me has progressed me as a person. I've had many opportunities like public speaking, band, aerial photography and more to really explore what I'm good at other than just skiing. Race ready, three, two, one, go. The moment when I'm at the top of a slope of a big competition is when I realise what really matters. All the hard work I put in, all the endless support from my family and friends, all the challenges I'm faced with to get to this spot. The spot on the top of the hill where I, while I am ready to speed myself down, I realise my dream of being started was small. With my mum talking to me, taking me to the snow and watching my idol, Scott Nella, like a bullet out of a gun, dancing down the hill. Without my challenges, I wouldn't be prepared as I am now. I let go of what is holding me back. And in the moment, as I am speeding, flying, sailing, floating, and it is all over, and I must start anew again. I've reached the bottom of the hill. My journey has only just begun. Thank you so much, Ben. I'm sure a lot of kids will relate to that in this area. Um, our final speaker, um, sorry, please welcome our second speaker in the senior division this afternoon from Year 11, Zach Corkin. Whether it be one word, like love, hate, black, white, or racist, or even a line from a song. The written word can invoke feelings of love, hate, peace, laughter, happiness. Throughout history, the choice to write has educated, divided, conquered, and inspired fear. To choose to write is to reject silence. This quote was taken from Chamanda Ngozi Adichie, giving the Arthur Miller Freedom to Write Festival. Silence. Often spoken about, but never heard. Silence is the absence or lack of sound. When Chamanda told us to write in order to reject silence, it filled that empty void of silence with an idea. That idea is that we cannot live in fear. Our voice and opinion are just as important as anyone else's. Two texts that I've studied in my year 11 curriculum are Talking to My Country and The Night of Never Letting Go. Both of these articulate this notion. Stan Grant's book, Talking to My Country, is written by a successful Indigenous journalist and discusses how he feels about Australia as well as how he came to be this man that he is today. Throughout the book, Grant talks about how he as a child was constantly silenced 
and always treated different just because he was Indigenous. I was born into the great Australian silence. It was the period of forgetting. The myths we created fed into Australia's lie that no blood had stained the waddle. Grant was brought up in a culture that was told to be silent in order to make us, the white Australians, comfortable. Australia, a peaceful country with origins of fairness and equality? Grant's words tear at this notion. Grant writes to reject silence. He rejects his own silence, the silence of his people, and the silence of this very nation. Without people like Grant, who stand up and speak the truth, the world falls to lies and misconceptions. Unfortunately, Grant's truth is one that claws into the very fabric of Australia. And as such, this has a very significant impact on all of those who come across it. Silence and song go hand in hand. Pauses are often used for dramatic effect. Interestingly, Grant talks about how he never found a connection to Australia's national anthem. An anthem that really only came into effect in 1984. He speaks about representation and belonging. For him, this anthem is silent. It does not speak for him or for who his people are. Grant states, when an anthem is played and the flag is raised, we are reminded that this country is not ours, certainly not ours alone. His silence is understandable, but so is his desire to speak up against it, to provide his own anthem for his words, ideals, and for his people. Ours alone. Ours alone. He often uses the collective term of our in addressing his audience. He is not there to divide, but to unite us, to bring us all together. I think for Grant, he is concerned to know whether or not people will listen if he chooses to reject the silence and speak for himself. Speak up for yourself, Grant reminds us. Speak up for your culture, for who you are. Choose to write, choose to inform, and choose to speak. In Patrick Ness's book, The Knife of Never Letting Go, this is quite the opposite. No one writes or reads as their thoughts can be communicated all the time. As such, there's never any silence. There is no rejection, no censoring, no keeping anything to yourself, but most importantly, no privacy. But there's still plenty of fear, just in a different way. How do you stop your thoughts so that no one hears you? There is so much quiet in it. No, not quiet, silence. So much unbelievable silence that I start to feel really torn up, like I'm about to lose the most valuable thing ever. In this quote, the main character, Todd, is talking about how he fears that he will never, ever hear anything ever again. This character is torn, potentially about to experience this life that Grant has been warning us away from. Fear, loss, rejection, the feeling of being this outcast is ever present. Unlike Grant, Todd wants his thoughts known. This character has a fear of being noticed. He hates the idea of people peering into his head and seeing all his noise. Instead, Todd tries to do what most of us do. He attempts to cover all this silence up, to hide himself away from this world. In the text, we see fear of exposure quite clearly. People are often afraid of judgment and being the outcast, just living on the edge. Instead, Grant, and I hope myself this afternoon, would encourage you to do the former, to speak up, to reject silence. If these authors chose to remain silent, we would not experience those feelings or create this opinion that I have today. Stan Grant wrote his autobiography, not only to educate us on his upbringing, but to give a voice to his lifelong struggles of growing up in a mix of white and indigenous Australians. Ness leads us to believe that he created this whole world with silence, nowhere to be seen. But every thought is heard. Still, everyone else has a voice. It's just in their head. Sometimes it's very important for those voices to be heard. Sometimes we just need to reject the silence. Sometimes we need to write or even deliver a speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach.
Our final speaker for the afternoon from Year 12 is Willem Baldwinson. Please don't ask me what I want to be when I grow up. I think it was around Year 7 it began. That is, every time we had a family get-together, everyone would ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm not sure if it's just an icebreaker from those loving relatives who really don't know what else to talk about with an awkward teen, or if the query comes from a deep place of concern about my future. If you're like me, and you don't know the answer to the big question, and you're stressed about it, it's really hard to think about your future and what you want to do for the rest of your life. No pressure, right? As, as I began year 12, my future rapidly approaching, I noticed a greater intensity of the dreaded question. Last Christmas was the last straw. If I was asked once, I must have been asked 20 times. Oh, I'm not sure, maybe something in the sciences. I'm still exploring my options with some of my responses. By the time it came round to my great auntie Bertha, uh, who, asked, who I decided to be a little bit facetious with and blurted out, thanks for asking auntie Bertha, I think I've decided I want to be a male stripper. Now she's a little deaf and there was a long pause of silence. And without as much as a tremble of her teacup, she smiled and said, That's lovely, Willem. I always liked that magical mic. <laughs> Jokes aside, though, why does everyone want to, need to know what I want to be when I grow up? You see, I find the question troublesome as it puts someone under pressure to answer, even if you don't really know the answer. You come up with something that the person asking wants to hear. Decisions made boxed in, become what you said, become what you have said, even if that's not what you really want to be. As you can see, this could be dangerous for some people who put themselves on a path that could lead to a great source of unhappiness in their life, all from one question. Eventually, it had played on my mind so much that I thought I'd better play the game and work out what it is I want to be when I grow up. So with the dulcet tones of Eminem beating in my ears, I decided to consult Dr. Google to answer this question. Boom, boom, tsh, boom, 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 tsh. If you have one shot, one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted, one moment, would you capture it or just let it slip back to reality? What do I want to be when I grow up? Tips and advice on how to consider career options and decide what could be the best career for you. Choosing a job or career is one of the most important decisions of your life. No pressure there. How to get started. Keep in mind that skills pay the bills. You don't need a PhD to get a good job, but most of the best jobs in the fastest growing fields require specialized training beyond what you get in high school. Here's how you can start the process. Number one, make a list of five to 10 jobs you've already thought about. Keep in mind that you can always remove and add jobs from the list and learn more about what to do and what you do and don't like about them. Number two, organize the list, putting your favorites at the top. For your top three choices, list the positives and negatives. For example, if veterinarian is, your top, is at the top of your list, a positive reason for that is choosing because you love animals. On the negative side, it takes eight years of college to become a vet and it's not easy to get into vet school. Listing positives and negatives will help you start figuring out what's important to you. For instance, starting your own business is a big commitment. Is it more important to be your own boss, or would you rather have more time for your family? Number three, take some career tests. Once you get the best results, once you get the results of your career test, you'll be able to compare the results to the list you made. If you find a match, it's a good place to start digging deeper. Don't, act, don't worry if you don't get a result you don't like. The tests aren't perfect, and you can cross jobs off at any time. Number four, talk to a parent, teacher, or guidance counselor. A good teacher will likely have some smart things to say about your ideas and your talents. Start the conversation by bringing in your list. It will show the teacher that you're serious. If you don't, want to, if you don't like what the teacher has to say, you don't have to follow the advice, but it won't hurt to hear it. Talk to another trusted family members or friends. The more you talk to, the more ideas you'll get. I asked mom and dad, but that didn't really help too much because mom said no one really knows what they want to be. And dad said, you'll never really grow up, so it doesn't matter. Ha <laughs> ha, dad joke. But there may be some truth to that statement. Take Mr. Bland, for example. Number five, 
Learn more about the job by doing some online research. Some questions you can ask yourself and seek answers to include. What kind of training do you need to get the job? Does it require university education? Do you have the marks of the course? Can you handle the courses? How much does the job pay? And if the answer is not much, is that important to you? By now, I've got the feeling that my head is about to explode and I'm no closer to the answer. After pondering some more, I had a breakthrough. Maybe it's not the thought behind the question, but the question itself that is the problem. That's it, the question is loaded. The question shouldn't be what do I want to be when I grow up, but who do I want to be when I grow up? Because then I could answer. In fact, a whole bunch of more interesting questions come to mind when you rephrase the question. Things like, what do you love to do? What do you want to learn more about and what makes you happy? I think asking questions is important because it provokes thought, but what I think is more important is being allowed to try what you want, whether it is a career or anything else, and not having those choices limited by expectation, even if those choices lead to adversity. Because as Einstein said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. When someone is trapped in the box, they become defined by their job. And that shouldn't be what defines someone. A person's character should be what defines them, no matter what job they have. And after all, George Shaw once said, Life isn't about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. For me, I want to lead an inquisitive life where I'm not afraid to question things, things around me and I'm able to do so respectfully. I want to be a person who is kind, understanding and appreciative of the people and things around me. And most of all, I want to be me. Something Steve Jobs once said, which is stuck with me and I think is a good reminder, no matter how old you are, which is, your time is limited. So don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. So please, don't ask me what I want to be when I grow up, because the answer will be, I don't know. Thank you so much, Willem. I really related to that as a Year 12 student. So thank you, that concludes our speeches. Uh, while the adjudicators confer, I would like to welcome Dr. Bell to speak. Thank you. Well, congratulations to you all. You've done a fantastic job. And uh, I hope that each of you are feeling really proud right now about what you've just done in the last hour and a half. I, um, where's Charlie? Charlie, what was, just for other people's benefit, because they didn't get to or hear you, what was the title of your speech? Getting out of your comfort zone. Getting out of your comfort zone. So hopefully everyone can relate to that. I'm sure you can, and I'm sure you had some nerves and potentially some anxiety. And if you did, then you're very normal. And if you didn't, you're probably not so normal because that's what everyone naturally experiences in these situations. And even for the year 12 students who've done this for a number of years in a row, I'm sure still felt a little bit of that. And that's a healthy thing, that's a good thing. Sitting behind me here, I was sitting there when I was watching you, looking at our four values here, and the very first one was courage. And I was connecting with that with you as you were speaking. And uh, I hope that your good friends who aren't here uh, in the room and didn't speak today were really supportive of you speaking and that's a good sign that they are good friends of yours. Um, but I, I think in the process of you choosing to speak, you've been authentic to yourself in wanting to do something, as Charlie indicated, to get out of your comfort zone and you spoke about growing as a result of that. And that's exactly what you all did today, whether you realise it or not. We don't necessarily need our judges to come back in because quite truly you all did win today in, in the personal growth that you just achieved in what I think is a really important skill in life. Some of you spoke about justice, social justice it was a strong theme today, whether it was for animals or whether it was for people or different subgroups of people. 
Some of you talked about family and support and other people talked about or brought in elements of humour into your speeches and they're all very, very important topics. I don't know if you remember, but when you were younger, your parents probably said something to you like, sticks and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me. Do you remember that? Can you remember that? Same with me, and I'm sure my parents were told that, and their parents, and it goes through the generations. And I think that's a really appropriate saying when you're three or four or five. And then what happens is you grow and you mature and you become more aware of the world around you, in upper primary school particularly, and then, of course, from that point onwards. And so we then become more aware of the meaning that sits behind words and what underpins what's being said, the intentions that are attached to those. And a lot of you today showed a real command of that, in my view. You really spoke with purpose. And so if, if I give you an example of the importance of words, the power of words, which is what you all did today, um, there's, a, there's a, um, a program in the US, which some of you might be aware of or heard of, called the Innocence Project. And so it's a firm set up specifically to look at people who are incarcerated in jail for crimes they did not commit. And where new evidence has come to light, whether it be DNA or other evidence has come to light to prove that they didn't commit those crimes or have anything to do with them. And in some of those cases, they're sentenced to the death penalty in some states or life imprisonment for others, which goes beyond two or three decades in some cases. And then they work tirelessly through the use of influence, underpinned by the power of words, to overcome those obstacles, which are much harder to overcome than, the, than what placed them into that situation in the first place. So whether, the, whether it's the construction of laws at the time, the amendment to those laws, the way they're argued in court, the influence of the what they call attorneys in the US, the barristers in our case, what their influence in that situation to a jury to convict these people innocently, to put them in jail, comes back to the power of what you just did, the command of the, of the words and the communication principles that you just conveyed to us. We've seen other examples recently in the media with social injustices and the responses to that, again, in the same country, in the US in particular, with the riots that are going on over a race issue. Some of you talked about coronavirus and the impacts of that. And again, our politicians who have to put together legislation quickly and communicate that and influence us that these are the right things for us to be doing in our best interests, not just here, but all around the world. Again, they're doing what you did today, standing up in front of people and using the power of words to communicate really, really important issues that have life-threatening consequences. So what you've done today is incredibly powerful. And I suppose the last example, where some of you used, used humour and support as part of that as well in some cases, is also powerful. Because it goes beyond, it takes us beyond intellect and it takes us into another place of influence where we feel an emotional response to that. And some of you used that today as well, whether it was through humour or through serious conversations around justice, we're, we're in that realm of your speaking today. And so, as, a, as an older person in the room, a uh, more experienced person in the room, I look back to where you were and I regret the opportunities that I passed up like what you took up today. So I commend you for taking up those opportunities and not passing it by. The easy choice for you today and leading up to today was to say no to this opportunity and to go out there and play sport today or go back to class or whatever it may have been to not spend those nights practising and just to concentrate on other things. That was the easy choice. So I commend you for making, taking the hard choice and growing from that, which gives you an enrichment and, and what I would call a building block for life. One of the things that we can't do as a school, one of the things your parents can't do, something that no amount of money can buy in this world is self-worth. The only place you can get it is for yourself. You have to earn that through doing things. And sometimes when we don't do so well, we learn more than when we do well. But either way, we grow from those experiences. And today, I know that you all grew a little bit in your own self-esteem, your own self-worth, 
and your own confidence by getting up here, no matter what the outcome, and congratulations to you for doing that. Very proud of you. I'm sure your parents are as well, for those who got to watch you, and, um, and I'm sure your friends are as well. So as a school, we certainly are, so well done. Um, would you just give each other a round of applause? Because none of you are in here to, to hear each other. So well done. I think Winston's going to do some thank yous a little bit later, aren't you? But, um, so I, I, I always have a habit of jumping the gun on that one, so I think I'll, I'll leave it to Winston to do that. But yeah. um, um, the two, two of our adjudicators out there, as you know, are former students. Some of the newer students here at the school may not know that. Um, and they've been, they were standing right here where you were today in previous years, and I'm sure that if you got a chance to talk to them about that, that they would value that, and that's one of the reasons why they've come back to help adjudicate in this decision today, which wouldn't be easy for them, and that's why they'll be taking some time, because they'll be going through that very, very carefully, knowing that responsibility. And I don't think that they probably thought when they were standing where you were that they'd be back here adjudicating this after they'd graduated from the school. And so I'm excited to see Maybe in years, years down the track, some of you might come back and also help adjudicate in some of these events and give back to this school community as these two have done in, in even Rebecca today. So thank you for coming back to support this event. I won't hold the decision up anymore, so good timing and um, we'll hand over to you. hand over to Rebecca and Eve to give the adjudication and present the division certificates and then Dr Bell will present the overall winning trophy. Um, so good job everyone, uh, honestly so so impressive. Every time I come back I think they get better and better but uh, there can only be a few winners so I guess uh, we'll start from the beginning. So the upper primary division we gave to Georgette Philpott. <laughs> Um, for the Sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, for the junior division, we then uh, gave to Emily Wilsmer. So the winner for the Intermediate Division was Alexi Cross. Awesome. And the winner for the Senior Division for 2020 was Zach Corcoran. Thank you. super hard um, but I think we wanted to echo the winner's point message um, that uh, words are so so important um, and it's very important that you all keep on speaking oh, for the camera. <laughs> um, and yeah keep on not being afraid to um, participate in things like this um, and not be silent so Zach I think you say exactly enough to give you take it. Social distance. Yeah, so well done. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you all so much for your amazing points. We learned a lot today. Great job. Thanks so much everyone. That concludes the 2020 Marie Kissage Public Speaking Competition. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Well done to everyone.
Um, okay, there's a people's choice. The people who are watching online have been putting in polls to see um, who they like the most in each division. So we'll start off with uh, upper primary um, goes to Stella Smith. Okay, um, the next in the junior division um, is Zali Gininen. And then in intermediate, um, the People's Choice winner was Alexi Cross. And the senior division was Willem Wolverson. And, um, sorry, I missed that part. Okay, there's also, we'd really like to thank, um, come on down. We'd really like to thank the two adjudicators for coming down and, um, Adjudicating and judging, so these are the gifts. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to sit over Thank you. Okay. Just before we go, to um, these events don't happen without people giving back to our community. So again, thank you. I reiterate that in our appreciation. And we were just thinking that, that as you were coming into the room, maybe someone else. Um, in our audience today might come back in future years and you probably didn't think about that at the time, but yeah, mm -hmm. so thanks for giving back. Um, and <coughs> Miss Jones and Mrs. Badson also have um, um, been the reason that you get these opportunities and uh, Miss Jones has been involved with this for a long time, this particular event now, and Miss Batson for quite a few years as well. So would you give them thanks too for... <laughs> There's been some other staff who've helped with some of the information for the technology, so thanks to, to, to Mrs. Darlington, to Mr. Ross, um, Mr. Price, for your support as well, and Mr. Moyer, our IT manager as well. So thanks to all those people who've helped enable this. And, and also we had one speaker who came in on Zoom too, which was great to use that technology as well. He's based in Canberra today. So congratulations to you all. Really well done. Thanks. <laughs> Congrats, guys!